For those of you who know, that was in um, two weeks of intensives working on my master's in the past two weeks. And last week we studied the theology of Old Testament. And then this past week we actually studied the survey of the history of our church, of church history. And we went back all the way back in the beginning of the, the, the days where, 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 where Christ ascended to heaven. And we were talking about in the book of Acts where God empowered and the Holy Spirit fell upon the people. And they started to grow in leaps and bounds. The Bible said that he added to their numbers daily right, those that were in fellowship with each other. And the thing about the Bible is this, it's like it's good to read the Bible, but it's also, under, it's also good to understand the context in which the Bible was written. What was going on during the time? What was the cultural background to find out who specifically was Paul writing to or those that were writing the synoptic gospels? What was going on during that time? It gives us a deeper understanding of the Bible and also in the culture in which it was written in. It talked about in some of our um, um, studies on how culture had shaped the church, how the Hellenistic age and also this geo-Roman influence uh, started to shape the way that people started to think. And I was reading this article on this myth of this geo-Roman love, right? Because we're in this uh, sermon series called The Uncommon, right? So we're, we're, we're talking about the uncommon love or the uncommon faith or an, even this uncommon God that is so foreign to, 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 to the things around us. Even the, the very thing that we, we profess to, to, to use as our mission here at South Bay, we talked about living to bless others is something that is very uncommon in a world that lives to beat others, that leaves to break others, that, that leaves to belittle others. When, when we say that we want to be a church to live to bless others, it's very uncommon. And so today I just thought it'd be very fitting to, to share on an uncommon love. Like this sacrifice before us today, communion, is about an uncommon love. It's something that is completely foreign to the human experience. So this geo-Roman love, this, ge this Greco-Roman love, and how, how this has actually shaped our relationship with God and also with others. See, this uh, Greco-Roman love is, is a love that is mainly driven by feelings and emotions and passion. It's, it's, it's a romantic love. And we tend to associate this romanticized love also with God. And I, I want to take you back to understand that, that that's actually a false way. It's not biblical. It is not a biblical love when we romanticize this idea that everything in the human experience is driven by our feelings and our emotions and in our passions. You see, we have this image when we think of the Greco-Roman love, right, this pagan love. We think, we think of a little baby who has wings and flies around with his bow and arrow and shoots love darts at people. And once it hits you and hits the other person, and you look at each other, and you start to say things like, you complete me. <laughs> we fall in love, this passion, desire. We, we start to say other things like, you are my all and all. Some men might be even a little smoother and say, you must be from Tennessee. Because you're the only 10 I see. <laughs> Young men are taking notes, I see. Taking notes. I should charge you, but I give it to you for free. We say things about this passionate love like uh, uh, heaven must be missing an angel. We even wrote a song about this type of love. It says, Cupid, draw back your bow. And let your arrow flow straight to my lover's heart for me. Even in church, we have this unhealthy view about love. It's driven by feeling. It's driven by emotion. We say things like, you should follow your heart. People come with us with all sorts of challenges and issues, and we tell them, you should follow your heart. But the prophet Jeremiah tells us something about the heart. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It says that the heart is hopelessly dark. It's deceitful. It's a puzzle at times for us to try to figure it out. But God, 
The God, the true love, this God with this uncommon love, he searches our heart. And then he also searches our mind. He wants to find out what is the root to the very thing that we claim to be. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't target the fabricated part of us. He targets the true us, the real us, the one that he created. How, how is it that we can trust our heart uh, of even this common love that we've been so accustomed to? Is this what love is? This overwhelming emotion and feeling that compels us to love others and to love God? You see, the problem with this kind of love is it is solely driven by passion. It is solely driven by feeling and emotion. So what happens is this. When we, we, when we attend a service that doesn't really bless us, and, and we leave the service uh, agitated and still uh, feeling as if God wasn't present, or maybe going through the week where you feel as if God wasn't there, then guess what we say? I guess God doesn't love me. Because I don't feel him. We've, we've, we've reduced God to a feeling. And we've reduced God to an emotion. This is common love. It's the same thing that we do in our own relationships where we say, well, you don't really love me like you used to. I remember back then, you know, when you were on the phone. For those of you kids, I'm going to date myself. But I remember back then where we didn't have cell phones. All we had was a really long wire that went from the kitchen to every single room. And if your mother wanted to find you, she would just follow the wire. And that you would probably be hiding in your room behind the door, talking to your girlfriend on the other side of the line. And then oftentimes, remember those times where you would fall asleep and there, all you could hear is breathing on the other end. You'd wake up and be like, oh, we're still on the phone. We fell asleep. I just love to hear you breathe. This is, this, is, this is an emotional, like, this, 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 this is not a biblical love. This is not a biblical love. We have bought into this lie of this common pagan type of love. But family, today I want to give you a biblical definition of what love is. Can I give you a biblical definition of what love is? A biblical definition of love is this. It's an act of the will. Accompanied by emotion that leads to action on behalf of its object. Did you get that? So it's up here for you. Let me, let me just kind of break this down for you again. So a biblical love is this. It's an act of the will. So first and foremost, love is a choice. Love is a choice. We choose to love. And for, for, for many of us, it's a conditional love. That's what makes it a common love. Right, because let's be real, we choose who we want to love. Right? We have a conditional love. And then sometimes the very person that we choose to love, sometimes we don't love them all the time. All the couples in the house say amen, amen. and ouch. Because oftentimes that love is conditional and I love you now, but then later on it's like you're just, not, you're just unlovable right now. So love is, first and foremost, it's an act of the will. We choose to love. God chose to love. The greatest, one of the greatest gifts God gave us was the very thing that he also has, which is this freedom of will to choose. God had a, a, a he had a, a heart to choose us to be called children of God. And then he says this, I'll give you the freedom of will to choose to love me back. So it's an act of the will, and then it says it's uh, accompanied by emotion. So love and the will of God isn't void from emotion, nor is it led by emotion, but there's emotion there. So the act of the will is not void, right? It's not led by, but it's still part of love. And then watch what happens. It leads to an action on behalf of of its object. So his action was his love for us. His action was his death for us. That was his action on the object of which it is us, in which God chose to die, to live, and to love you. Jesus is our model of this love. He is the perfect model of this uncommon love. 
So he tells us in the book of Ephesians, he relates this love to men and wives. Men, he says, he says, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And then he goes even deeper, right? Because he says it's not just about love, it's about a sacrificial love. So God doesn't just love the church, but he gave his life for her. Now, can I tell you something, right? So he chooses, that is his action, his sacrificial love is his action. He chooses to love the church. Can, can I ask you something? Like, did he choose to love the church because the church, right? Because the church is in reference to his bride. He didn't choose to love the bride because she looked good. Right? Matter of fact, if you look at the history behind our church, the bride has been so unfaithful to the bridegroom, yet he still chooses... But yet he says, uh, men love your wives as, as Christ loved the church and gave his life. He's giving his life for the bride, even though the bride is unfaithful Amen. to the bridegroom. He gave his life as an act. This is the act of the will with emotion, which leads him to the action. And what reminds me of today, if I can just kind of hone it in a little bit more, is the, 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 the week leading up to Jesus giving his life as a sacrifice. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he sits down and he kneels and he's praying to the Father. And he says this, if there's any way possible that this bitter cup can be removed from me. Can I tell you that this is the emotion that we're talking about in this love? He's saying, he's saying look God, he's like, if there's any way possible, he says, I don't want to go through this. This is the emotional part, yet it is not, it's not just solely feelings and passions. It's the emotion, but yet it's not, it's not led by emotions. Because right after that, he says this. It's his will. It's his choice. He says, but Lord, not my will, but your will be done. This, this is an uncommon love. It was an act of his will. He chose to go to the cross, not for himself, but for, for us. What is this radical love? What is this uncommon love? It wasn't filled with emotion. He said, even, even as he was sweating, drops of blood were coming down. But that, that still led him uh, to this action on his sacrificial love for us. He chose the cross not because he needed it, but because we needed it. And then our target text today, family, as we bring this, uh, as we bring this home, that talks about an uncommon love that chose to die for us. The Bible tells us in Romans, it says, for when we were still without strength, it's talking about salvation. It says, while you were still able to try to do things to get you a level up or a level out, he says, there's nothing humanly possible that we can do to save ourselves. He says, yet you were still weak and you had no strength. You had no ability or lack within yourself to save yourself, yet still, yet still. The story that always comes to mind is this, this, this young man who was drowning in the ocean. And his family notices it, and none of them can get there fast enough, so they all run to the, to the lifeguard and says, look, my brother or my friend, the, the young man that's out there, he's dying. And, and the lifeguard grabs his tube, and he's getting ready to run out, and he kind of waits there for a little bit longer. And people are wondering, why aren't you diving in there? The man is dying. And he's seeing this, this young man splashing around, and he, he's trying to save himself. And he waits until the man only, almost like loses everything. Every, every, every inch of strength, and he starts to go down. And then the lifeguard jumps in and swims towards him and grabs him and pulls him back into safety. And the people around them are upset, saying, why did you wait so long to save him? Don't you know he could have died? And the lifeguard tells him, he says, I had to wait till he exhausted every effort of trying to save himself. Because had I gotten out there, he would have killed him and me at the same time. So it wasn't until he realized that he couldn't save himself was I able to jump in and save him. If you're, if you're, if you're thrashing around in the ocean of life today and you're trying to save yourself, you're trying to do things for yourself and you're praying, God, where are you? Why haven't you shown up? Lord, I'm battling this addiction. Lord, the bills are just really, they're piling up. God, my children are just going out of whack. Lord, this job is driving me crazy. Finances aren't meeting up. And you're like, where are you, God? And God is like, I'm waiting for you to stop doing it for yourself. To bring you to a point where 
It's not about you. It's not about what we could do. It's about what he has done. Even while we were still sinners, the Bible says, for scarcely for a righteous man will, will, will one die, perhaps a good man. Can I tell you, man, I have five sons. I wouldn't give up one son for any of you. As much as I love South Bay, Dave, as much as I love you, I'd never give up one of my sons for you. Moises, as much as I love you, you know, I would have four left, but still. Right? And nor should you ever give up any of your children for me. Yet God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is an uncommon love. And then he goes in to say this. This is amazing because I love, I love, I love this word in the Bible. But. Whenever there's a but, you know God is about to do something. He's going to say something. He's, and Paul likes to do this in his writing. He, he likes to set things up. He, even asks, he, he likes to ask questions and he answers his own question, right? But he always uses this word but. Even while we were still sinners. He says, but, right? He says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still, you fill in the blank. Even while we were still prideful, God still died for us. Even though you were still uh, harboring animosity towards somebody, God still died for you. Even, even though, you, even though you were, you're coveting your neighbor's car or wife or husband, whatever the case may be, yet God still died for you. Even though you were stuck in an addiction, watching pornography, whatever that was, God is still, he says, I will still die. Even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Family, as you participate in communion today, know that it's about an uncommon love. As you remember the body that was broken, as you remember the agony on the cross, know that he chose to be there. He chose that even while we were still sinners, did you know even the beginning of the text, even the ungodly, the ungodly sinners, yet he still died for us as you participate in communion today. Know, know that you are loved with an uncommon, radical love. A love that's not just solely based on feelings and emotions, but a love that has chosen you and made a conscious decision that we would choose Christ. As you participate, you are choosing to partake in communion. It's a choice. As you fellowship with brethren, as you, as you wash each other's feet, as you serve one another, it's a choice. Don't choose who you will serve, just serve. God has given us this choice. I pray that through this worship service, through this communion, that you in return would choose him and choose this uncommon love.